Would you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 once again? And we're in a minute, we're going to read verse 4 through 7. Amos, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. I'm not a prophet nor a prophet's son. I'm a concrete finisher and a form carpenter. I make my living by the skill of my hands, the sweat of my brow, and the strength of my back. Amos encouraged me, though, and you ought to come to the Wednesday night lecture series in those minor prophets. It will strengthen your faith. Amos said this, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who but can prophesy? That's my warrant this morning. And that is the warrant of every Christian. Woman, man, child. If you learn something from from the word of God regarding salvation, regarding the walk, your walk with the Lord, You have an authority to teach it to others. And so, let's read this morning these few verses. I'll be reading from the King James, Old King James Bible. There are, there are the, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Oh, Father, help. Help for the godly man ceases for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Father, it is to you we look this morning to build us up in our most holy faith, to equip us for the tasks ahead. Father, to encourage our lives in the difficulties that we face. Build up our faith, we pray, Lord. Convict the sinner of his sin and draw him to the Savior this morning. And above all things, may Jesus Christ, the God of glory, the creator, be magnified among us today. It's because of him we can pray. The word of God is very powerful. Even in its its larger context, in its smaller context, sections, in its narrower paragraphs, in its sentences, in its very phrases, and I want to draw your attention to just a simple few words here in this passage where God says, where it says, the scripture says, for the, in the middle of verse 5 there, for the Lord God, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, verse 7, excuse me, uh, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and here it is, breathed into his nostrils the breath 
of life. Here in this passage, in verse 5 and then also in verse 7, is the first mention of the familiar, if, you're re- if you read the Bible much, the Lord in all caps in our translations, translating Jehovah, Yahweh. It's, some have said the personal name of God is the name, the name that the children of Israel knew God by. And here we have the first mention of that in hermeneutics, in the study of the interpretation of Scripture. Often the first mention, the introductory mention of a word or a phrase is of great importance. And so it is that this mention of the Lord God frames all that comes, all that we come to know on the topic. All that we come to know about Him is framed in this particular passage, this particular idea that we have before us. If that is true, then, we should ask the question, who is the Lord Jehovah Elohim, God. Who is he in the light of this phrase? For your consideration this morning, I'd offer a few thoughts. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. See, first of all, the proximity, the closeness that that implies. This one, Jehovah God, is the one that is close. He's not a God far off. He's not a God separated from us. Oh, wait, you say, you read in the Scriptures that that, uh, we are separated from God. Adam and Eve were cut off from the garden, cut off from God, separated from God. That is true. In our current situation, you are cut off from God if you're not a believer. If you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're separated from Him. But the fact is that that separation has only come because of your sin. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, so says Isaiah. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. But from the beginning it was not so. He is a God, Jehovah Elohim is a God that is very near. See, first, also, secondly, the tenderness of it, the love of it. <laughs> you, you get the scene, you get the picture, the mental image that is portrayed here. I know that this is what uh, theologians call anthropomorphic. God does not have uh, a mouth, a face. But he communicates a truth to us in language that we can understand in this passage. He gets down. He comes to man in such a loving and a kind and a tender and a gentle manner. Do you see it in this picture? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. See also the intimacy of it, the personal nature nature of it. Jehovah God gets down, as it were, nose to nose, face to face with this lump of dirt. Who do you let into your personal space. When I was a lot younger, I've got stories to tell, okay? (laughs) When I was a lot younger, 
I remember my grandchildren, my oldest granddaughter, Michaela. You, many of you have met her. We were living in Warland at the time, and I loved to get down and play with my grandchildren. We'd play horsey, if you know what that is. And I'd throw them up in the air, and they loved it. She was probably, I don't know, she could talk. So I suppose she was three or so. And uh, actually, she just plumb wore me out playing with her. And I crawled up on the couch and was laying there. And she jumped up on my belly. She got her nose right close to my face and she grabbed my cheeks. I don't know whether you ever had a child do that. She grabbed my cheeks and she made me make a like this, you know. And she said this, Grandpa, I love you. <laughs> I didn't tell her. Her parents often told her to say, I love you, Grandpa, you know. But this was not that. <laughs> and this is... The genius, the wonder, the beauty of this passage. God, Jehovah God, the creator of the universe. The great power that spoke things into existence. Gets down right nose to nose with this clump of dirt worth maybe a few dollars. Interest rates being 9% per annum, maybe a few dollars more. But he gets down to that worthless and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And therein is the dignity of man. This beautiful, wonderful intimacy that God desires. The adage is often spoken, Bible Christianity is not a religion. Maybe you've said this before. It's not a religion, but a relationship. And in some ways, that is true. It is a relationship. So there is the intimacy of it. There is also the initiation of it. Who came to who? Of course, he was dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Jehovah God came to this lifeless body. No, into, no soul, no spirit. Just newly formed. And God has been doing that ever since. When Adam fell, who came to who? Jehovah sought him out. In the incarnation, Jesus Christ came to us. God the Son came to us. So there is the, <clears throat> the proximity of it, the tenderness of it, the initiation of it, the intimacy of it. And lastly, the life-giving nature of it. He is the intimate one. He is the one that comes to us. He is the one that loves us. He is the one that gives us life. He is life itself. So the New Testament informs us. He gives life and he is life. And here is Jesus in this wonderful chapter we find in the book of John, John chapter 10. The great shepherd portion of the New Testament. And he says this, he says, I am come that they might have life. And you know the next phrase, don't you? And they might have life more abundantly. Real living. To know him is life. To know him is living, real, 
kind of living. And so, this verse frames all that follows in Scripture. <clears throat> this verse frames what we find in, in Genesis 22 and verse 14. And you remember that passage. It's the passage that we sang about this morning where Abraham is called of God to take his son, his only son, the son of the promise, up to a mountain, Mount Moriah, which incidentally <clears throat> can be traced to the... <clears throat> Thank you. I do have one in my back pocket, John. Can be traced to Mount Zion. The place where Christ offered his life. And what do we find in that passage that Abraham does not God, God puts the sentence of death upon his son, and Abraham obeys God, takes his son to the mountain, and is about to plunge the knife into his son when he is held back. And there it is, the substitute caught in a thicket. Perfect substitute caught by his horns. Beloved, this is a picture of Jesus, the substitute that keeps the guilty one. I know you say, Isaac wasn't guilty. Uh, I beg to differ with you. He was a son of Adam. He was a sinner. He deserved to die. God had sentenced him to die. But there was a substitute for him. And so, in that passage, we read that, uh, <clears throat> let me turn there, because I won't be able to quote it very well. I should have marked all these. <clears throat> and Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh to this day in the King James, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The place of God's provision, the sacrifice for sin that saves the sinner, the one condemned to death. And so this loving Jehovah God that breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life is the one that provides a sacrifice for sin. Exodus 15 Maybe you'd like to turn with me to these passages, seeing as how I'm going to be slow about it anyway. Exodus 15 and verse 26. In this passage, Moses sings this wonderful song, and Miriam sings back. And Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, we read in verse 22, and they went out into the wilderness. They were th three days in the wilderness and found no water. And they came to Marah, where water was bitter. And the water was healed. When Moses cried out to the Lord, he showed him a tree and he cast it into the waters. If you will diligently, in verse 26, hearken unto me the voice of the Lord thy God, 
and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. Jehovah Rofeka, the Jehovah God, the Lord God that breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life is the Lord God that provides a sacrifice that heals. In Exodus 17, Moses is on a mountain and there is war in the valley. And we read in verse 13 that Joshua discomfited Amalek in the old English and his people with the edge of the sword. You get the idea. There was victory in Joshua's sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write for a memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. That is, the Lord my banner, the one that gives victory. And so, the Lord God of Genesis 2 and verse 7 is the Lord God that gives victory. And each one of these can be expanded throughout the Bible, can be traced, these concepts can be traced through the Bible. And they're all framed in this first mention of Jehovah God, that loving one, that tender one. And we find, is that clock right? I, I had a guy, I, I was pastor of a church in Wyoming, and I had a fellow in church that, uh, he, he was a good guy, I loved him. But when I would get, oh, go overtime, he would stand up, we, we had th- two, just uh, one pew, to, or one aisle down the middle, and he would get up and stand up out of his place, and he would stand in that middle aisle, and he would look at me, and he would look back at the clock like that. <laughs> This was a fun, fun bunch of people, and uh, I really enjoyed them, and I got the idea. So, if anybody wants to do that, and okay, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Rophica, Jehovah Jerah, and to Gideon, he was Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, and he he told him, don't fr- don't be afraid. Gideon. And so Jesus, we hear Jesus, just as he's about to be crucified and he's leaving his disciples and he teaches them, he says, my peace I give to you. He's the loving God of peace. And in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And in Jeremiah 23 and verse 6, by and large, the book of Jeremiah is a book of condemnation for the children of Israel. But in this, there are a few bright spots, and in this is one of them, where God makes this promise. And he says this, the Lord, in, in uh, my King James Bible, I don't know exactly what, the, what was in the translator's minds, but it's in all capital letters. The Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. And so this is what springs from the God that, gets down and breathes into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And finally, at the end of the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35, 
Ezekiel has been describing a temple that is an amazing thing, a place of God's dwelling. And he describes it in great detail, and it's a wonderful, amazing thing that he is describing, but at the very end of it, he says this, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord, Jehovah is there. And you know what? That's what heaven is going to be. We read books about what heaven's like, but the most important feature of heaven is that's where Jesus is. That's where God is. And that ought to be enough for us. <clears throat> One more thing I have to say this morning and I'll be done. It's this. And uh, I've got 10 points here. <laughs> but I'll run through them quickly. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. The Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament. Why can I say that so confidently, so authoritatively? What is said, and this is why, what is said of Jehovah, what is given in Holy Scripture of Jehovah in the Old Testament is said of Jesus in the New Testament. Run through them quickly. He is the King of Kings. In Psalm 95 and verse 3, reiterated in 1 Timothy 6. He is the Lord of Lords in Psalm 136, reiterated in Revelation 19. He is the stone of stumbling found in Isaiah chapter 8, reiterated in 1 Peter chapter 2. He is the judge. Too many scriptures to mention in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Hebrews 12, Colossians 1, John chapter 5, He is the judge. You will stand before Him either condemned in your sins to an eternity without Him in a lake of fire or dressed in His righteousness. He is your judge. He is the reigning King, Isaiah 24 Reiterated in Matthew 25, he is the good shepherd, Isaiah chapter 40, and that beloved chapter, John 10. He is the only Savior, Isaiah 43. He is the only Savior, 2 Timothy chapter 1. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, in Isaiah 44. <clears throat> and again, in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 1, speaking of Jesus himself. He is the creator, Isaiah 44, John chapter 1, in, the, <clears throat> in him uh, were all things created, and without him was not anything made that was made. And also Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. To him every knee shall bow, to Jehovah every knee shall bow, Isaiah 45. To Jesus every knee shall bow, Philippians chapter 2. And he, Jehovah, is one Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And Jesus is spoken of Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Beloved, embrace Jesus. We, uh, the gospel, or the uh, apostle of love, he came to be called, John, that wrote these several books in the New Testament. He said this, we love him because, <laughs> say it with me, he first 
loved us. May Jesus Christ be praised.